Yeah, I've actually got my run-in order from um, the second session we did in 1972 with David. Just here I've got little uh, who was on what and which vocals we would overdub and so on. And uh, while we're in the middle of doing, I think maybe doing a guitar overdub or something, David actually drew, um, I don't know whether you call it a cartoon or a picture, on the bottom of my run-in order. And there it still is to this day. <laughs> you know, the glam thing had started to happen with Matt Boland uh, and stuff. And you, the, the music industry had gone through the blues stage, you know, the Beatles, the Stones, and it went into this blues stage with bands like Cream and that coming through and the rock, and you've got the deep purple and you've got all that, which was okay for the heavier people. But for the younger kids uh, and that, the, there really wasn't anything except poppy records. There wasn't anything you could like. There was no hero, superhero for them. You know what I mean? It, it, there hadn't been any for a while. And when Bowie came along with Ziggy, he was a superhero, really. They latched onto that superhero, you know. I mean, they came to see Ziggy Stardust, not David Bowie. That's what they came to see. And that was their hero, you know, and, and, and that's how it works. It's cartoon character. And that's what he was on stage, you know, and it worked perfectly, the way it was put together. The Dream Genie was, the song was, uh, David wrote on the back of a Greyhound bus on the way to Memphis, Tennessee, from New York. And originally, the guy that did the paintings on the album covers, Funky Dory and Ziggy, George Underwood, was sat at the back of the bus with Bowie's Les Paul. And he was playing that riff. And a few Chuck Berry songs he was messing about with. And David happened to cock Calton on to. So when George put the guitar down, David picked it up and started playing the same thing, the same chord riff. And he sat at the back of the bus for about about an hour and a half, just messing about and singing. They were all at the back of the bus. And three days later, we went back to New York and we went in the studios in New York and he played as Jane Genie. And he played the whole song to us and then he said, we'll do a run through. So we did a run through and we all knew it was like, I'm a man by the Yardbirds. We'd all played that before many times as kids. And then we had one go at it and we didn't keep that take and then we had one more go at it and that was the take we kept which if you listen to on the record is where I actually make the bass mistake that's so famous that everybody points out to me where I go down to the B too early <laughs> but it fits so we keep it and I still today if I play that song I still play that mistake because everybody says you've got to play that mistake you know you've got to play that mistake so it was kept it was done in one go and everything was kept the guitar solo and I remember we, we started, I think it was 11 o'clock, and by 12 o'clock it, it was all finished and mixed. And a week later it was, it was number two in the charts in England. It was the fastest single ever recorded, <laughs> I think. I mean, it's a good album, but what is it? It's an album of cover songs. There was a story once that Bowie, somebody asked Bowie about um, why did he do that album? And he said, Oh, I did the album because the band were bored and needed something to do, so he blamed us for it. When actually, I always remember going around to a hotel in, in London and he was playing me all the songs that he was going to do on the album and I knew not about it. <laughs> so, it was an album he, he thought, he, he, he was pressurised, I think. You know, when record companies, he's got big success, they want another album. And I don't think he had the songs. He'd been out on the road touring and I don't really think he had the mat you don't think he had the material, I don't think he had the direction, where to go, or anything. And uh, I think it was, how can I fill this gap quick? And he, he picked some great songs, but it wasn't a Bowie album. It was a cover version album. And the last thing people want when you're riding on the high of Ziggy and all that insane and is for him to come out and do a cover, a cover album. You know, they want new material. It was pretty, not a nice ending to, to such a great, time you know um, it, it, uh, it still gets me today you know I still think about it and think you know if we'd have just done this you know never mind with them, without David or whatever but if we'd have just gone on and done something else and carried it through a bit further uh, but unfortunately it stopped when Ronson did his solo albums and uh, Woody got fired uh, and I sort of did this album with Ainsley Dunbar, but the heart had gone out of the band then, you know, I mean, Ainsley Dunbar's a great drummer, but it's not Woody Wood, see.
And one minute we were doing the show and everything was going fine, you know, and the next he was retiring and the band was fired. We were treated very badly. Uh, I mean, even Andrew Bowie quotes in her book that um, me and Woody never got any of the money that we we were supposed to get and that we deserved. We were we were left without anything, you know. I mean, uh, I blame a lot of that in a lot of respects on the management. You know, we, we were promised because we, the, the whole thing had grown up at Adam Hall. The whole thing had started at Adam Hall, and we'd all been involved together. Okay, David was the artist. But the whole thing had grown together. We, the band and him had made that into what it was. And so we were promised a percentage of what was in. And David always, would always say, oh, we're all going to be really rich, you know, after this, because we'd started to make it. So we're all going to be really rich. Don't you worry, we'll all be fine. And of course, when it came down to the, the breakup of it all, it was, he was gone. He couldn't, you couldn't find him anywhere. And, of course, Tony DeVries would say, well, I never promised you anything. So you finished up penniless. Uh, and they finished up earning, well, DeVries finished up earning lots of money off it. And they weren't interested. I think that, that the one thing that really hurt was, you know, they, they just weren't interested in your welfare. After all you'd done. Because we did play a big part in that. And after all we'd done, and after we'd built up that we were all going to be really looked after, and we'd, you know, we all had families and kids, and we'd get a house and car, and you know, we could look after our children and and all that. And then at the end of it, you, you, you finish up on the dole. The drugs were what caused him to be unbearable to work with. He wasn't god awful when I met him. He really wasn't. He was charming. The drugs in America caused him to be first incommunicable. He, he couldn't speak, he couldn't put two words together. Throw him on a stage, he was fine. He could do the whole show and come off and he'd be a blithering idiot. But like Marianne Faithful, throw him on a stage and he was fine. But that's not enough, I'm sorry. I wasn't in awe of what he did on stage. I've, I've seen better people on stage. What I was interested in was whether we were delivering quality material. I know it sounds camp, but I'm serious. I'm really that old-fashioned. I just wanted to know that it was a great show and the music was as great as it could be and you could hear it and they looked good and it was exciting. Well, I accomplished that. I couldn't accomplish anymore. After that, he wouldn't talk to me. After that, I was persona non grata. All he wanted to do was to get rid of me. It just happened gradually. The bigger he got, the more fame he got. Was He always wanted to be famous and the more and more he got of it. You know, it's an animal, isn't it, fame? takes you over you know I, I just think it took him over like a lot of artists it does and they, they think that there's somebody bigger than everybody else and they're better and whatever and really they're not you know and it it engulfed him did stardom it uh, it turned him into a different person that i'd met in the, in the beginning you know i mean i think he's like he's back to how he was before you know now or has been for many years most likely but um to go from being sort of known to being a huge star, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's hard work, is that? It must be tough. I mean, generally, it was, I guess it was fun as well, above everything. You did your job, you did, you did what was wanted live and everything else, and you had a good time. Um, it's like that thing of the happy times are getting there, not necessarily when you get there. You know, when you look back, you um, you realise that they were the good times, and you, you didn't sort of notice the really good times because you were going through them, thinking the good time was at the other end. But you get there and look back, and you go, "No, that was a good time." You know, I and mean, even sleeping in a sleeping bag on his landing in his flat, which is where we probably slept for about a year. The whole band were in sleeping bags, you know, doing the first albums and that. And at the time, you think it's rough. You look back and you think, no, nah, it was actually cool. We got up, um, had a coffee, went down and played drums straight away and, and jammed, and then had breakfast and, you know, um, it was good. It was a good scene, you know. I can't say I would change anything. Maybe the ending, but the rest of it was just... It was superb, you know. 
it's part of my career. It's, it's the highlight of my career in a way, you know. I mean, Ziggy's a brilliant album. That, it's not my favourite album, but it's a great album that was, uh, I think it was voted best album of all time for like 15 years in Billboard. And, that. and I played on it. From playing in Hull in pubs and clubs to doing that, uh, it's tremendous, you know, there's not many people get that chance.